um, you know, I've had opportunities to work in Christian settings. Um, but particularly, I think from my, so with IGE, where I worked previously with the organization, but I think also my dissertation, the big, the big question, not framed as a social science question, but just why I did what I did, was to understand, like, how do you integrate a minority? And why is that a flawed question? Um, and, um, and so trying to understand the, the intersection of security and minority integration, I think that that's something that's been um, a consistent thread across all the stuff that I've done. Um, and uh, I guess what, what makes me alive is that, you know, um, um, Christ loved, loved me enough to give his life, so how do I be a peacemaker? How do I let him be a peacemaker through me? And, uh, and, and build states and societies that, uh, where you can do that. And so, um, in the name of Christ. And so uh, that's, that's, that's what makes me alive. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I had Drew mentioned. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota, so lots of Swedes and Norwegians there. I consider myself Scandinavian. <laughs> I, was, I was recruited for ice hockey here at Dartmouth College. <laughs> that's true. Not, that's true. not the first Asian goalie, the second Asian goalie. <laughs> I played during a time uh, where Jason Wong from Vancouver was also the team, so Jason Wong and Mike Chen together, we made the Great Wall. <laughs> I got very involved in campus ministry here at Dartmouth, and so really group, love that uh, experience of creating community and, and worship, uh, studying scripture, and uh, but had great fears and, and graduated uh, and went to medical school out of fear, not faith. Uh, so I dropped out of medical school and ended up in seminary, Princeton Seminary, working in campus ministry in New York City. Uh, it's a group of love cities, and, and New York City in particular. Uh, spent a number of years doing campus ministry there with navigators, uh, and now we're in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm married to one wife, and I have two kids, two boys. We're on uh, Pokemon Go level 28. My work so my work right now is with a campus ministry group called CCO, and we partner with colleges, uh, universities, organizations, and churches primarily. Uh, I really have, a, have a, a passion for faith and work integration, working with students on that level. Um, for four years I spent uh, primarily at the University of Pennsylvania working with students there, and um, for the last three years I've stepped into the role of director for cross-cultural ministry, So, which means I work primarily on the issues of race uh, and cultural diversity, uh, both helping our organization think about these questions in light of the gospel, uh, but also uh, speaking on many different campuses and uh, universities on the topics of race and cultural diversity. So. And, and to follow John's question, you answered a little bit about what, what you're passionate about, what, what games do you like? Well, Pokemon Go to me is just fascinating. Moving <laughs> <laughs> on. <laughs> so Mike and I are dear friends. Um, our, our children were both, or all, all five of them were in West Philadelphia born and raised. So if you've seen this person, it's Bel Air. That came from our families. Um, so Mike and I met uh, in Philadelphia. We were both pastors at a church in, um, in near Penn, Penn City Church. Um, I'll rewind and tell you very quickly about myself. Um, from Ohio, uh, engineering school, mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, worked, uh, did some intern did an internship with NASA and had some uh, experience in design that was very formative for me there. Um, went to work um, uh, after college uh, doing uh, robotics for manufacturing for a small company. I'm following uh, an amazing boss that uh, interviewed me, and I love dearly as a dear friend to me today. Um, but interestingly, uh, as I, I, I did really, uh, when I was in college, was not inculcated with a thoroughgoing theology of faith and work. So uh, as I was making uh, a factory that makes aerosol batteries, or telecommunications cables, or truck transmissions, 0.0004% more efficient. I thought a little bit about the meaning of life. <laughs> so I had a friend call me one day and say, hey, I'm, I'm planning on going to Bosnia. And I said, that's fantastic. You know, I have a job now. I'd love to support you. You don't even need to ask. And I'd love to help you be there. And he said, would you like to go with me? And that was a very life-changing question for me. I hung up the phone and my roommate said, I think that's the question you've been waiting to hear for a long time. So I ended up going to Bosnia. And, and leaving that job. So I made a very orthogonal move. 
and was in Sarajevo, Bosnia, working with college students in post war Bosnia in Sarajevo for three years. Uh, I came back and went to seminary, I had been did at Westminster Seminary in Philly, worked at the church there, and met Mike. And then, as I was there ministering as a, as a pastor, uh, either a pastor with an engineer's mind or an engineer with a pastor's heart, I'm not sure which, and it'll probably be figured out uh, when, you know, in, in, a, in a later day. Um, I realized that really my call and my passion was to be uh, in the workforce, uh, out in the workforce using my engineering education and doing pastoral ministry in, in the marketplace. And so my passions are, are engineering and design, but also the, the cultivation of human capital and how do understanding that the people that not only do you serve, but the people that work are resources as well. How do you cultivate those resources, not just to make the production process more efficient, but how do you, how do you nurture your customers created in the image of God and the people your workers created in the image of God? So that's, that's my question. And I love jazz music. So if you were to turn on John Coltrane's Love Supreme, I will quote Cornell West from two days ago. I echo him. I love Cornell West because he would call me Brother Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I love that about him. Um, if you turned on John Coltrane's Love Supreme, I could just sit down and be happy for how many minutes that thing runs. Um, so that's it. So, um, first question that we want to talk about from our different perspectives is, is it's an open um, When When you consider the idea of seeking value and meaning in your life and work in general, start with you. What are the predominant issues that surface for you? And to tag onto that, what texts or theological ideas or philosophies in general have shaped that understanding of, of seeking value and meaning and work in a life? That's great. Um, I, I think that for me, I, I want to break it out into three levels and, um, and then just think about how, um, how Christ enables to reimagine the first two levels. So, the first level is, I think, for value and meaning. When you think about it, it's um, about, and, and Dave wanted this a lot more oh, in some ways, but I think that it's about um, you know shedding light on those sorts of intrinsic, the work that we do for intrinsic purposes as opposed to extrinsic purposes. So, so you know, oh, uh, I I do work that's meaningful because it's you know consistent according to some sort of code of ethics or something like that. And um, I think that's a really important caveat to what you hear in you know the college setting. Um, I was you know a TA during grad school, talking to students about what they wanted to do, how marketable they wanted to be. And I think that that's an important caveat that doing things that are meaningful actually um, provides for some really great moments that really make up for the trade-off in salary. My wife's in the audience, Carl Sue. She works at a mental health clinic that serves Latino um, residents of. of uh, Triangle area in North Carolina, and uh, she works in some really, really hard situations. And in the current political context, it's actually no easier um, to, to work with that population. But I think she wouldn't give it up for the world. And I think that looking that first level of, of just living life in a principled way, that's really an important part of it. The second level is also think about leadership, because um, you know when you lead, when you live that life of public service, you actually are. Uh, Acting in a way that defines the future by which people find other other people find their work meaningful, and I think that that's also really important too as we think about you know how do I live in a way that adds value and also is meaningful is thinking you know how is that how is it meaningful for somewhere else, someone else not just for me, um, and but I think that um, third way I would think about that too is seeing life in a way that makes God the point of reference so that our lives are ultimately meaningful not because we find them valuable. Or because other people find our leadership beneficial, but because we discover for whom our lives are made and to whose authority our lives are owed. And so we return our lives to God through repentance, through entrusting our lives to Him, through loving Him. And so, for example, I think Jesus said if you see a sovereign God in the distance and you don't negotiate with Him, you ask for terms of peace, right? Luke 14, 31 32. So when we come to the table to a sovereign God, just from a Christian perspective, you know, we don't come to God seeking, because we're, hey, God, you give me the most, you probably offer me the most meaningful op of options out of this list of options that I have. You provide me the most meaningful life I could have. Actually, what Jesus says is, no, this is the war table, you should sit in that, they got 20,000 troops, you got one, you 
that's what we always do. And I think that ultimately we confront the ultimate reality by which the meaning of our eternal existence is defined. So I think we live on a rock, and that's I think an important. That's a I think that that's an important way to anchor I think our discussion of value and meaning because I think, um, you know, from that perspective, we can start to live as changed people as opposed to people who want to change the world. And I think when we, when we take on that perspective, it actually frees us up a lot. Because I think the life of leadership and the life of principled excellence, they're actually pretty punishing. Um, when you think about it, they actually have some pretty harsh practical realities. And so I think if we don't come back to the, those, that second and first level and reimagine it with hope and joy, because we know that God's already won the victory, because God is ultimately the definer of reality, we're going to be crushed by that life of leadership, <coughs> and, and we're going to be subject to the most disappointment. And I think from the flip side, too, there's an invitation from the sovereignty of God. Hey, if God is our rock, if all we have to do is live out of the rest that we have in God, then all of a sudden we can start to think about the vision that God has for us that exceeds what we could even imagine, what we're even ready for, what we even think we're capable of. And I think what we understand that through Jesus, God is a gift-giving God, who gives us a freedom to accept or reject that gift of relationship with him, I think we're, we, we can start to think about how he's actually moving in the world. We can think about leadership at that second level, not just about you know, acting on behalf of others. What does it mean to not just lead, but to partner with other leaders with whom you have irreconcilable differences? And that's, I think, the point of civility. That's the point at which societies are actually built. It's not just your leadership versus someone else's leadership. It's actually partnering. And so I think that, um, anyways, that's a, that's a lot of ways of taking it, but I think that um, it's really important to define your point of reference when you're thinking about, um, about value and meaning. And um, whether that's you, whether that's others, whether that's God, but ultimately coming back to seeing that heavenly citizenship, seeing that, seeing that who you are, God, infusing the other two, um, so you can really be solved in life, because God solved my life. Okay. In fact, it is interesting that this, I think at least the subtext, at least for me, in understanding the value of meaning in my life is that leadership is a category. And I, and I, I hear a lot of people talking about that. Am I, am I a good leader? Would I be a good leader? It's about leadership training, right? So um, it's it's not, I think, in the sort of top three categories that they've laid out, but as a subtext, it's this, am I a good leader? Or will I go through life as a follower? Right? We have these sort of false categories, right, that are very worldly defined. Um, and even when I think about leadership, I think it's helpful to hear that because I think of leadership very individualistic. Right? It's, and I don't even know if it's fully defined in my mind. And a lot of people I don't hear it fully defined in their mind. It's just obliquely, what is, you know, are you, is this person a good leader? What does that mean? They can get things done and they can make people happy along the way, that kind of thing. But you're saying it's leadership is a, is a king calling and it has to do with being and service to others and has to be vision for others. That's, yeah. Um, I think I really resonated with Dave's initial thought about sort of the Platonic theism. And again, I'm, I'm no um, no philosopher, but I do find that you know we pull things out in dualistic categories mostly for pedagogy, for to sort of teach ourselves to understand ideas. But a lot of times we hold on to those dualistic <coughs> categories because because they are they're sort of easy to, to learn and categorize. Um, and so I, I want to, uh, in some ways, in my development, stay in the sort of childlike uh, or adolescent understanding of them uh, and, and work out of that dualism in my mind. Re in reality, there's more of a spectrum of, and a grayness in the application of that, right? So um, and it applies to all different kinds of things. But for me, um, this the ideas in in Genesis of people being created with value and then being created to work. Right? So and we there are bumper stickers that come out of this, right? We talk about that, right? Am I a living being or am I a living doing, right? And, or is it, am I who I am or am I what I do? Right? And and how do I integrate both of those things? And a lot of times we layer them over one another. I think that's really helpful to understand that yeah, there are two there are two parts to us. Um, but it is clear that from the creation narrative in Genesis and in the scriptures that, that human beings are created with inherent value. 
it cannot be denied by that tax. But they're also created with inherent potential. Right? So they're created, and then they're created to work. Right? So there is this definitive creation, and it is good. Right? It is in the Hebrew tot ego. It's very good, actually, when man and woman are created. But then they're set to work and to cultivate a culture. Right? The, the Genesis narrative says a garden. But it's, uh, theologians will talk about a cultural mandate, right? What does it mean to just build up redemptive, uh, godly community uh, on, on earth? And so, and that's an open question in Genesis. What is that going to look like in Genesis 1 and 2? Genesis 3 and 4, things start to go downhill. But that open question says that there's, there is this like limitless potentiality, right, because of being created in the image of God to our work. And there's inherent value in that work. But there's also inherent value in who we are as people. And so I can very easily um, think about, well, I didn't do good work today. Right? And I really resonate with what Dave says. Like, if I don't get a lot done, and my wife's like, how was your day? I'm like, I'm going to get a lot done. Have fun smile. But I do very much measure myself on the number of things I do. Um, and I qualify those, like how valuable they are. It's all self-defined, maybe not in my worst moments. Um, but at the same time, I could look at somebody who doesn't have the potential to work, is, is unemployed, or uh, is, is uh, handicapped in a way that they are unable to work, right? And I would talk about, like, they certainly have inherent value, right? Um, and they, so work is not, our definition is not necessarily uh, work defined. But, as he said, even about the monks who think they're doing something in Tibet, right? Giving the world a monastic idea to, to consider in the conversation with the <laughs> human, they're doing their work, right? So, I think, for me, seeing both of those things in Genesis, that people, regardless of our capabilities, and of, our, of how we are, um, uh, how, we're, how we're born, where we're, what we're born into, the things that happen to us that give us or take away our abilities, um, there is this infusion of, of a both and, of I have inherent value, people have inherent value. And then also the work that we do, whether I define that work as going in at 8 and getting off at 5, or work in a very different, uh, less de Western defined sort of way, uh, that also has inherent value. So um, holding those two things in tension is, um, is really important. And, and be, being able to um, navigate that on a day to day basis. Uh, and important. I think also, um, well, I think that's very important when think, thinking about value and meaning in work, not only for my individual uh, work, my own assessment of myself, but in terms of leadership, right? And how do I interact with coworkers? How do I interact with peers? Right? Do I interact with people as if they both have value and work to do? Or, or what, 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 how do I balance those things? And then also people that I might lead. Also people that I report to. How do I navigate those complexities and those kinds of relationships? So um, I think leadership and, and um, the, the derivative of that being in community. The, the last thing I would say is that um, a lot of my understanding of my meaning and um, the, the ways that I do it poorly actually, have to do when I, I consider it individualistically. Right? I take on a Western mindset an American mindset, which is I put my, you know, I put my labor in the ground, John Locke, and I get out the value, and it's mine. Right? And there's very much a, here's the kind of leader I am. Here's the kind of work I do. Here's the kind of value I make. Here's the kind of value I create. When, in reality, and it's funny, I, because I work dichotomistically, right? I, my brain, I know. Well, our 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 15 person startup here in Hanover is a team, right? I'm not the sales guy, and I'm glad. Um, I'm the engineer, I'm the manufacturing engineer. There are things that other people do that I couldn't do as well, and that's great. I can say that, but when I lie awake on my bed at night, and I really think about my value, I don't think about it in terms of being with a team. Right? I don't think about being in community with other people, whether it's in my work team, or whether it's being on my block, right? or being with, with friends. It's um, do I create value? Do I add <coughs> value? Do I have value? Both in who I am and what I do, but also not just me myself. It's a part of a collective whole because God has also created community. God himself is community. Right? 
So we actually can't separate our existence from the sense of community has created this God. So do I think about my value as being a member of something bigger than myself and not just me as a whole? Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm still puzzling over this uh, quotation from the third century. Well, essentially, what, what do Christians bring to the world? What, what value, distinctive value do, do Christians bring to the world? This is an observation sent to a, uh, uh, an official um, named Diognetus in the third century. It, it, it's, it's a little bit like the other. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own, or speak a strange dialect, or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based on reveries inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned. Because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their abuse, answer to abuse. Deference, the response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors, but even then, they rejoice, as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. How, uh, you know, how far have we gone from this? Where the, the society around us would see us as this vivifying, uh, joyful, uh, life-giving you know, life presence in whatever area, um, so distinctive, uh, offering such a powerful uh, presence. You know, how, how far have we gone? So um, I think what, what sort of stood out to me in Dave's presentation is that this big question of why is very much grounded in, in the, the questions of where, do we, where are we from? Where is it, you know, who are we? Where are we going? Uh, to me, what's so distinctive, has been so distinctive about the Christian narrative is a very robust answers to those questions uh, in almost a narrative form. And so the, like the Bible, I don't, I, I don't believe it's like an answer book of religion, of rules. It's a love story. So to the extent that we know that love story, where Drew, where Drew started talking about Genesis, about how God creates the world out of love, not out of violence, according to some of the, you know, the competing narratives uh, around it. That, the, the, that Christians offer us a subversive narrative to the world. Do we know that narrative? So our ability to answer the question why is contingent on knowing, on knowing that narrative. So from Genesis, and, and seeing the image of God in, in the face of the other, seeing the inherent you know, the value of work, as, as Drew mentioned, uh, the gleaning laws in, in Deuteronomy and Ruth, uh, to Jeremiah, resident aliens seeking the peace and prosperity uh, of Babylon. Right? And so that now this opening up of the expansive story of, of Christ and the redemption and the blessings that will flow uh, not only to a particular tribe uh, in, in uh, Jerusalem but to the world. Right? And so Paul, I'm so fascinated by that. Paul's use of the term gospel. Right? It's, not a, it's not a religious term that he made up. Like the gospel, the good news was the announcement of, of a Caesar's birth. Or when Caesar would sort of co-opt a land, or, or you know, and take a land. So he's, he's saying, you know, Caesar is not Lord. 
the gospel is not fundamentally about Caesar, but it's about Jesus and this new kingdom that Jesus is bringing and has his inaugurated, right? So that is this like subversive narrative that I think Christians offer and say it's a sort of contradistinction of the power, coercive uh, 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 violence uh, that we see and experience uh, to live out of fear rather than uh, faith and sacrificial love. So to the extent that we understand, I think, this subversive narrative, uh, we actually can start to bring uh, new life to the world. So I, I'll give you a quick example. Um, I live in Philadelphia, and um, I've been teaching on this idea, uh, again, uh, particularly of, of racial reconciliation, uh, that we see the face of God. We see the very presence of God in, in the other, whoever we might define as the other. Uh, as, as people that uh, we would much rather be, you know, have nothing to do with. Uh, and so I'm walking down the street. This is, this is in the last month. Uh, I'm walking down the street, and there's a um, drunk, high, maybe demon possessed, maybe some combination of, of, of that, uh, walking towards me. I step to the side to avoid him. He steps with me. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I'm clearly, he's like looking for a confrontation. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Here's my opportunity to see the face of God, to grant the dignity to this to this person made in the image of God with dignity. Here's the opportunity. So I ask him, hey, what's your name? And he's a little startled. But I don't think he's used to. He's not accustomed to be asked, you know, for someone to ask him his name. And so he says, my name's Africa, Africa King. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he said, what's your name? Before I get a chance to answer, he says, you're China King. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <don't forget. laughs> On some level, he knew, right? On some level, he knew he was created in the image of God, granted with a sense of power. Whether or not he's living out that power in, in the best ways, very debatable. But on some level, he knows his identity. And he knows my identity. And he, so he gets down and bows down to me and starts kissing my feet. And I'm looking around like, are anyone seeing this? Are anyone catching this on like, uh, camera? So he's down, he's still kissing my feet for like a minute. I'm like, this is really awkward. Not really awesome. He gets up, he has a Heineken in his hand. He gets up with his Heineken and says, drink it. And I'm like, no. That's for Africa King. And he just started laughing. We just have this, like, you know, we shake hands and we have this, this moment of like, okay, see you later. <laughs> he keeps on walking. I think he's going to go to the bar. Uh, but I look back and I, I figure I should just look back and see if uh, he if tries to confront someone else. Because most people probably wouldn't uh, react the way I did. Because that's not how the world operates. That's not the narrative in which the world operates. So I look back, and indeed, he's approaching a man who starts running across the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, at least he's running across the street. You know, I keep on walking. It turns out the man walking across the street is, is an elder in our church. <laughs> and I said, I saw him later that evening. I said, hey, I had the weirdest thing happen to me. I met this guy and said, I met this guy this demon possessed guy who was throwing trash bags at me, you know, as I ran as I ran away from him across the street. I said, You met Africa King. <laughs> <laughs> I'm juxtaposing you know, juxtaposing these uh, um, reactions. Like fleeing, not seeing, not apprehending, not acknowledging the dignity, right? running across the street. He gets, out of, he gets mad. He's mad. He starts throwing trash bags over the parked cars. <laughs> so to me, this is the distinct, like, the, and to me, it's, it's, I think it's because I've been just I'm teaching on this idea. But I've, I've actually, I, I challenge myself to like, live it out. Live it out. See the face of the God. See the, see the face of God in the other. Right? And so there are all sorts of different points of um, intersection, I think, where we start to take this inheritance. Who are we? Where are we from? What are we doing here on earth? Where is it all going? That starts to change actually how we live in a more integrated way that he's talking about.
Dave Beckham was talking about, this integration of what we believe, who we are, and what we believe. And I'm like, okay, this is starting to make sense. I'm slow to learn. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I'll say one more thing about, I think, um, it's a subversive narrative, I'll say it's a spirituality. Right? For me, worship, as I was here as a student at Dartmouth, and Jared and I, we were leading worship together. And one of the most formative things, I think, uh, I, I would say, for me as a student, sitting in Rollins, like hours, you know, like week to week, and the, in a large group settings, so it's like this experience of, of, um, of cultivating a space where joy is nurtured. David is talking about joy. Um, and so do we have, so that for me, that has become um, uh, an area of exploration. Like more than just singing and songs, uh, the liturgy associated with worship as a uh, countercultural uh, event where we solidify our identity as God's beloved and we start to live in the world more sacramentally. We start to see the world more sacramentally, see people differently. So, those, I would say those are some of the things that, uh, sort of foundationally, what, what are we doing? What, are, what value do Christians actually bring into the world? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you talk about um, where Mike lives and where I lived are walk away, so I have kind of vision that very vividly. Um, what strikes me is that the interaction that you would have with um, it's actually a very similar response that most people have that um, maybe are not in the same state of mind that he's in. But, you know, I, I'll speculate a little bit, but say, why would he throw trash bags at somebody across the street? But it's a, there's a bit of anger at being judged, right? And anger at the, perhaps the injustice of being excluded, right? And so the gospel, what is the gospel narrative? There's no more exclusion in the inclusion. Right. And so the fact that I mean, your interaction with that guy, um, I mean, it, the Lord, in, for, for a Christian, from a Christian standpoint, uh, there are these moments where you think, I think that God is actually speaking through this craziness. <laughs> And that's a that's a faith move, right? And and Saint Augustine actually said, Dude, those kind of signs are only, that they're valuable in as much as you allow them to be signs from the Lord." And it takes a, a living dynamic with God to know the difference. But to be able to say, "Is that demonstrative?" I mean, do I use the do I think about the good news message of the gospel, and with other people who are conventionally different than I would like them to be, conventionally like very well adjusted, threatening to. Do I cross the street? Do I avoid the contact? Because I'm, I'm, I'm worried, actually, about my safety. Um, and the response that I think the church gets when we respond that way. When I personally respond that way, I think when the church responds that way. I think that is, the church can be self-critical in, in, in that, to a degree, um, a large degree. The prophets were very critical in the church. They, they did the same. But it's very interesting to think that that, that that is actually maybe more typifying than unusual. But it's demonstrative. Let me ask you one follow up, quick follow up question. So, you talk about the message of Christianity as a, as, a, as a good news, as a gospel. Some people think it's definitely not good news. But for you who would say that it is good news and would espouse that mindset, uh, what about the mundane days when you come home and you're like, today? Today was terrible. Like it was terrible. Uh, what what does that? How do you appropriate that? Not saying that it's always perfect. Yeah. yeah. But in the mundane day to day, that's hard. How's that good news? Good. I, I was very uh, in high school. I was very determined, uh, you know, to go to the East Coast to leave Ivy League school and you know, built up my resume. Uh, I became very depressed and very lonely as a result of you know, doing that. I did not have a language to explain what was happening to my soul in that pursuit and what it cost me. So I was like, like you know, 
got a B plus or A minus and I'm in tears. You know? mm -hmm. This thing of like, what's happening to my life? And my sister asked, who's a very committed Christian every time, asked me a question like, what does God think about your situation? Which forced me to think the thoughts of God. What does God think about your situation? So I, I had to turn to scripture. I, I, I looked to the Psalms and it actually gave me a language uh, for loss, for heartache, bitterness, for anger. And all of those things were okay before God. Processing those things with God. Uh, and I've been, it's been a, a, a struggle to actually not, and you know, to feel like you're this Christian, professional Christian, you have to have it all together. I don't. You know, going through hard stuff. <laughs> it's just like, um, but how do we, how do we do, like, how do we do that? I, I think against the Psalms, the worship, um, actually give us the, you know, the liturgy, actually give us a language um, where we feel like there are no words for the kinds of things that, the, the trauma that we experience. Um, and, 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 and to, to bring that to the world of, of, of depression, anxiety, mental health, taking on college campuses, and young people, suicide. Um, I've been in ministry, in college ministry 12, 12 years. I've been at least 12 suicides on average a year. And, uh, and the kinds of things that, that people wrestle through and hide. And to me, uh, Christianity offers um, a space, a safe space right, for lament, for actually bringing to God our anger, deep anger, uh, in, in that transformation, transformative space actually op uh, opens up, up a way for you, right? For, for, for the power of God, the restorative power of God to, to make an actual difference. Where God is good actually means something. Right? So that the mundane kind of uh, losses and the mundane like setbacks are so important to grieve, and I haven't done that well. That's been a, that's been a regret. I think. I've, not having learned that. Um, that it's okay to make space uh, to grieve, even the, the, like, the small things. Yeah, I think for, for anybody who would who would not espouse the Christian mindset, it is uh, one of the major unknowns is to realize that the, the, the holy texts of Christianity have anxiety, anger, fear, horrible, horrible actions, uh, and they're all done in, uh, in at least in, in the Psalms, those, those experiences which are so uh, common to us are actually given in worship. They are the worship texts of Israel. It's, it's absolutely sound. Uh, which I think early in vibes shows the meaning uh, underneath the experience. Jared, I'll throw it back to you. Um, what are ways that the combined sort of Ways that you think we get it wrong, mm -hmm. and maybe you combine maybe lessons learned. A little bit. How, how do we, we we hear we come to a conference, we talk about it, we muse on it, and then we get up and we go to class or the next day and we still want it. A different mindset. Yeah, I, I think um, talking about breakfast and um, I, I think that the an important an important thing is uh, satisfaction. I think I, I, I come from a, a range of experience in the social sector for, let's say, probably the time. And, and uh, being at um, HBC right now, um, being in a, a nonprofit in DC, um, and working in emerging state societies, and it, it's all really cool stuff. Um, I think that there, um, there's a tendency to professionalize the love of your neighbor. And, um, and so you feel like, okay, I'm not a nonprofit now. Like, I put in my time. Like, nine, nine, to, nine to six, at nine to seven, nine to 12 sometimes. I'm just loving my neighbor. <laughs> and, I think that, <laughs> and you don't even know what your roommate's going through. You don't even know what, how they're responding to, you know, your girlfriend or whatever, you know? And you don't care because you love your neighbor and you put your time in. And I think that um, that's a danger. Um, there's a certain vanity to being involved. I'm going to limit this a little bit to the social sector because I think that like meaning is really important because you actually like you give up money, but you get a lot of meaning, which is awesome. <laughs> and I think that um, there's a way that you could actually start to move family into 
a weird place where you say, like, okay, well, it's my career. Like, like God is calling me to my career. I'm going to sacrifice everything for my career because this is, like, a good thing. This is a godly thing, my career. And I think I had to be reminded at the beginning of, of college, um, my church did a study of the meaning of marriage. And all of a sudden, I was like, huh, God calls us to marriage. Like, marriage is not something that is, like, secondary to changing the world or making life great just for people who don't experience that. Actually, like, they're, they're, these are really important. We need to be just in the world, but God calls us into families. And um, I got married a year later. Good <laughs> 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 work. Way to go. Way to go, church, for encouraging us. No, but I think that, um, I think that uh, professionalizing, we can't professionalize, I think, our, um, our uh, loving of neighbor. And I think in addition to that, satisfaction, you learn, I think, in an environment like Dartmouth and you know, afterwards, you are not to be satisfied. You know, you, you know, like you're in one situation and here's the here's the anecdote of short, short breakfast. Like I actually had an awesome situation senior year. Like I was um, I had a Fulbright grant to go to Taiwan for a year, and I also got a Reynolds grant uh, to go to Beijing to study Qing Dynasty history. Um, and I was like, I'm going to get my master's in Tsinghua, and life's going to be great. <laughs> and, and so you had two great options. It really, like, this is like, you know, 0.1% world problems. Like, this is not really <laughs> horrible. And you know, at the time, I think I made a bad choice. I, I actually said, you know what, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with the brand name, because you can't say no to a full brand. And, um, and I was talking to my advisor at the time, and she was like, she's, I think she's still here, but she said, you know, what, do you want to be a teacher? Are you going to be teaching in English, English in the public school system for you? Do you want to do that? And um, I said, no, but I mean, I can, I can learn about the culture like on the side, and I'll do my public school, but I'll, you know, I'll be a Fulbright scholar, so then I got options. And that was my attitude. I didn't say exactly like that. But I think I did that, and I think it was, a, it was a good year, but it was a hard year. It was a really hard year. It really wasn't aligned with my heart, I think. And, um, you know, um, the Reynolds cramp is an incredibly prestigious honor. And, and um, but the prestige, forget that. What do you, what do you really want to do? And at the end of getting a lot of brand name stuff, I think you're still going to end up in this question, like, what do, I, what do you want to do? You got a PhD from Harvard, you got a great advanced degree, you got a great career, you got a great whatever. So, so what do you do with that? And, um, I think part of that has to do with satisfaction, with, you know, saying, you know, God is calling me into, um, yeah, he's calling me into those aspirations, but he's calling me to here right now. And um, it's a little bit nonlinear, but I think in some, some moments along those journeys, I sort of replicated that, like, Fulbright, um, Reynolds, it's not even long enough, but, you know, that situation. And I wasn't fully there. I was sort of like, what is the next thing I'm going to do? And I think that the... There's a, there's a great invitation of the gospel, I think, to, like, to think about your aspirations and to relate it to your vocation and what you're good at and say, like, you know, God, I think you're calling me here. You're calling me to more. But I'm going to lean in all the way here. I'm going to be all the way here and present. And I'm going to just enjoy what you're doing for me here and not missing out on that. Um, and um, so there's, there's other stuff, too. And if you, you know, want to talk about it, see me afterwards. But I think... Um, yeah, we're lessons learned, you know, things we get wrong. Don't professionalize your love of the neighbor. You like you need Jesus. You're still a wicked sinner, even if you're in a nonprofit <laughs> city. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and two, be, be satisfied. Be rest in God and where he's placed you. And if you don't understand it all right now, um, I'd say that those are I think um, when I think about ways that we get it wrong and, and leaving the Christian community, ways that I have in the past and, and continue to, um, I think, um, again, that, that dichotomy, it's just my engineering brain that likes those things, um, of realizing that the, the culture that God uh, is brain, brings through his, through creation and through his kingdom through the gospel message is uh, countercultural to a culture of the world. And the Bible uh, talks about that a good deal. At the same time, um, the 
gospel brings that message of good news into that world and, and it infuses that world. And I think it's very hard to hold those things in tension. Um, I um, am, I think that when I think about meaning and ways that I've chosen poorly myself, um, ways that I, um, in moments that I think, all right, this doesn't feel right or good, but it's probably the right decision, um, has to do um, with thinking, um, thinking through how uh, how the gospel calls us to sacrifice, but also um, the fact that I don't need to be worried about being unduly affected by the world as much as I might be. And I see people of faith wanting very much and a very holy desire, as the scriptures would say, to to abstain from things of the world. And so and I've seen the church push away culturally, right? So they become Christian things, right? Um, which, you know, as a Christian, you know, we, we, some have probably heard these kind of things. Is there Christian music? I don't think there's Christian music. I think there's music. God made music, right? It's, some of it's about God and some of it uh, talks about God or talks about life without his perspective, but it's all made by God. Um, I think that um, if I have a mindset where I'm in a, in a in first, adverse relationship to the culture or to my coworker or neighbor. Um, even if I can, I'm well adjusted enough to be really nice and know all how things kind of interiorly work and I can navigate that game. Um, I find that um, the full meaning that God would have for me, I, I find lacking in myself and I find um, that when I've taken risks to engage in the grayness and complexity, um, that uh, that the Lord has, has, has met me there with, with deep meaning. And, and I guess the, the to, to clarify that, the, the scripture that has meant a lot to me in regards to this is uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 7. It says that Jesus went up to a Jewish feast, and it says on the last and greatest day of the feast that he stood up and in a very loud voice said, If anyone would come after me, and drink, streams of living water would flow from the head. And there's a lot of backstory to that. Um, you can sort of read that at face value and go, oh, that just means you, Christian, feel like you sort of have this sort of internal power that, you know, if you have Jesus, it just kind of comes out. It's deeper than that, because the last and greatest day of that feast, that Jewish feast, was one where the priests would stand at the temple and they would pour out jars of water as a symbolic gesture to remind them of something in the prophets of the Old Testament. And that was from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, chapter 47, in this vision of a river that flowed out of the temple. And Ezekiel says, that, that the man, man walked me down, this is a, a vision, uh, a dream, the man of God walked me down and, and the, the, the river came out of the temple and he walked me down and it was ankle deep and then he walked me down a little further and it was knee deep and he walked me down a little further and it was waist deep and then so deep I couldn't cross. And then it says something that always, so it always struck me. It says, when the water flowed, where the river flowed into the sea, it made the salt water fresh. Which is usually not what rivers do to seas. <laughs> right? So, uh, usually rivers flow into seas, they become brackish for a while, and then it's more river. It's all sea. And there's something about what that, that specific river that makes the salt water fresh. And so Jesus was sort of harkening back to that. I can't imagine being there at that feast because I would have thought, Jesus, this guy's nuts. <laughs> this guy's crazy. But he's saying something about what he was espousing, what he was preaching and then his life lived, had to do with this message uh, and of this power of God that would actually be a changing force internally that where you would think that the sea would make the fresh water salty, somehow reversing. Now, I can't take that lock, stock, and barrel and say, well, you know, whatever I do then as a Christian, it's just whatever God, it's what God wants. Because clearly, you got the river, the river's going to do whatever it does. Right? So there's a spectrum again. Right? There's a, I can be scared and run away from my neighbor, from the culture. Or I can completely engage my neighbor and the culture on their own terms and just say, hey, let's all have fun. Or there can be this middle ground, right? The 
this complexity, this spectrum, this gray area, where I am realizing that um, I don't need to fear, but I need to be wise, right? And that's why I think they probably as far as text tagged the wisdom literature uh, from, from the Hebrew scriptures. And then I think how, uh, how do you rectify that? I think it, for the Christian, it comes through a living dynamic relationship, right? And so there is a, there's a, has an activity, um, an active relationship that between God and the follower of God that would allow me to know in a certain moment, this is the right thing to do, this is not the right thing to do. Right? There's no prescription. Right? In my relationships with friends, it's my relationships with my wife, there's nothing prescriptive like, other than love. Right? I can't, you know, I could, you could tell me I should rent my wife a card every day, but, you know, if I wrote my wife three cards every day, she'd sort of wonder, right, is, is this really meaningful? Like, nothing is, everything should be in, in the moment. How do, what is the right thing to do now? What's the wise thing to do? And how do I take God's meaning, meaning God's given me, and is giving me, and who I am in my work, and engage him live right now to say, what, what should be done right now? Because the response in this situation right now may not be the right response in a month. And so, on the spectrum of disengagement versus total acquiescence, there's something in the middle where an active relationship with God reminds me that I can engage uh, and uh, and give meaning and derive meaning through God, who, who God has made me in this work um, through that relationship. Mm, that's good. Um, I'll say just two things real, very quickly. Uh, I think some of the difficulties that Christians face today are uh, and have uh, forever is conflating Christianity with with the culture. And, um, I was sitting in a, in a car ride to a Christian conference, and one of the students uh, from the University of Pennsylvania is just describing his dream. And it's um, you know he's going to graduate, he did a great job, live in a city for a while, uh, get married, and then move to the suburbs and have kids. And he's like, well, it's kind of like the American dream, I guess. And like, huh? Uh, as as a Christian, you know, just to express that is the that is his dream. Uh, just reminded me again. This is, you know, how easily we conflate uh, the American dream uh, with the dream of the kingdom, of God's kingdom breaking in, breaking through, uh, and just the struggle that, that that we face. And so I, I think probably the most sort of devastating, some of the most devastating sort of ramifications of that would Christianity become colonialism. And the dream of this particular country that is now ratified by a Christian message or God, uh, it goes to subjugate another people. And, and, and it fundamentally does not acknowledge the work of God that's happened in another culture. And so, uh, I think it's, it's been a struggle. I think it's been a real struggle. Um, I'd say the other one too is just uh, our failure to lament. Our failure to for the church to truly understand lament uh, and, and truly um, know what it means to um, cry out before God uh, and in that transformation offer something different to the, to the world. It's noon. So um, we're uh, about on the clock, about half an hour away from lunch. I want to transition before our 60 minute timers go off and you all go into a pre food coma. Um, Questions, thoughts. What have you wrestled with? What What's been hard? Um, we don't We don't have a corner on all this, but we'd love to facilitate a conversation. We can pull in some lessons that we learned along the way. Um, what What do you think about Andrew? Schufer. Yeah. Um, you might. I wanted to add. So in that moment when you confronted after me, right? Like he confronted you know, me. But. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how did you reconcile his personal safety with, I'm going to engage with this guy, I have no choice, but how do I engage with him, stay safe, while well, also, like, oh wow, this could actually be like an opportunity for me to have an impact on this guy's life. And how did you reconcile that? To me, that kind of translates into, like, how we as Christians engage with culture in a way that's, like, you know, practical and, and, and safe, while also, like, I'm confident your God is going to see me through whatever comes at me. Uh, okay, so a week after, after it came, um, 
I was I was going into I'm heading to my friend's house, um, and coming up behind me is a week after Africa. <laughs> um, a young gentleman with a young black man with a gun. Uh, he, he tells me to, to get down uh, and open the door. So he wants to get into my friend's house to rob to rob. Him. Yeah. Um, I had this event with Africa King. I have this, this theology that says I need to acknowledge this person as made in the image of God. Perhaps he's not living that way right now. Uh, but he is pointing a gun at me. And so I, I turn to him and look him in the eye. And I say, no thank you. That's not happening right now. His friend comes up. So there are now two black, young black men with guns uh, pointed at me. He said, we're going to shoot you. And I get down and open the door. And I said, that's not happening. Sorry. <coughs> Looking in the eye, again, this is the image of God standing before me. In my mind, <laughs> as you, your question is how do you reconcile these things, in my mind, I'm like, yes, there's the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> <laughs> Moment. Yes, my body would be raised to, to new life. My family would be sad, probably for a time. But I think it's the right thing to do. And you know what they left? They said, let's get out of here. This guy's dead. <laughs> they probably looked at me and said, this guy's crazy. And I am. Because something has compelled me. Right, something greater. That I do not, you know, treasure my life even out of death. Right, this is the, the witness of revelation. I do not fear death. In that moment, I fear death. But in my head, as I've been trying to live more in this reality, uh, so I believe that is can be like a subversive again, like the subversive, uh, disruptive presence of love. But that comes at a cost, right now. It's, it's, it seems heroic, but I walk around and I look behind my back, you know, and I, it's just kind of like, oh. All right. I'm walking, you know, walking with God through that right now. You know, what, that, what does that all mean? So I, I do think, but I, I do think this kind of vulnerability and this, this, this presence of love offered to the world differently uh, is what, what changed the world. And I, I, I think the last month I've seen that. I would add to that though too. I think some. I mean, there's a more professional. Like, I, I, I'm not, I, I would take the flip side of it too. And it, it, like, it, it, there's a danger I think in extrapolating it out and saying like, I'm going to take on. And this is more of the professionalization that I'm talking about. Less of what Mike's talking, which is like, you're, you, you probably won't read me after. That's, I'm just saying that. You probably won't read that, meet Africa again. You probably won't meet the people who held up mic. So that, that's God working in the moment and, and, and the Holy Spirit revealing what needs to be done. But I think that, you know, there are also people who go into situations that are, are they don't know, they're not listening to people, and they're doing it in the name of loving their neighbor. And they're not loving their neighbor you know, language and logic as, as the neighbor understands. And that's not incarnational. And then it's really about you, right? It's more about like how awesome you are, how much God needs you, how much the world needs you. And I think that that's 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 there's some vanity there. And I think that um, I think sometimes that doesn't that doesn't do anything, anything that's better. And I, so at that point, you're risking your life because it's a heroic thing, but it's not something that actually is consistent with the culture. It's not something that actually is listening first to God still before God, and then listening to your neighbor. So John 4, Jesus at the well, like, is it safe for him to be at the well from a reputational standpoint with the Samaritan woman? I don't know, like, you know, but what does he do first? He listens, right? That's his methodology you know, for engagement. And um, he asks questions. And I think that um, from, from just to flip that, you know, from a long-term, big picture perspective too, just because you risk your safety does not necessarily mean you are doing the will of God in that moment. And so that, like that, as Mike has even said, this is coming out of a disciplined life of like worship and prayer and, and repentance before God. Say, like, God, what do you want me to do? And so I think that those are, that comes with spiritual, 
spiritual, emotional maturity, and so forth. Paul, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you guys uh, so much for sharing so far. Um, the quote, Mike, that you shared uh, is really resonating with the head of citizenship, which would be coming from a Christian perspective. Um, you know, can you can you kind of help us answer um, how heavenly citizenship, identifying who we are here on mission, um, informs your decision making specifically in the case like that you had, um, and it wasn't so much a balancing of the scales or a hierarchical. I value this more than in my life. Um, but there's something that it appears is, is framing the point of reference, almost like a lens in which you're looking through. How does heavenly citizenship do? I'll start. I'll, start. Yeah. I'll lay the bad track work in correct. <laughs> um, I uh, think that one of the perennial questions that uh, I boil things down in my mind, and one of the ways that I, I boil that for me, that question down, is what does it look like if I think about Christian values, by that I don't necessarily mean what would be considered family values of the 20th century evangelical church, I mean broadly looking at the gospel values of the church historically. And I would see this in contradiction in some ways to the world. Um, the question of how does a, for lack of a better term, kingdom, right, this Christian terminology, how does a kingdom bent on life approach a kingdom bent on death? That's a hard question. Um, when Cornell West spoke, he's actually teaching this summer here, and he's going through the philosophy of W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and um, I'm not a scholar on Du Bois, but he, uh, West elucidated several questions, um, which resonated with me, and I could pull them out. Um, but one of them, to paraphrase, was, what does what does integrity do in the face of injustice? Right, and I think that's for me it's heavenly citizenship. Um, and if I'm going to be ethereal about it and not be really boots on the ground, I can think, oh, I can I can define it. I mean, maybe uh, I can talk about perspectives and approaches. And um, but if I'm boots on the ground, and I either I'm on the streets of South 48th Street or I'm working in the nonprofit sector in North Carolina, and I come up against uh, values that I would think are just not optimal, right, according to the way that I think I was laid out. How do I, how does life conquer death when death seems to have this good tool that is acted in lots of ways, either through a gun or through bad uh, you know, uh, laws written or um, management styles, whatever. I think that you can't get away from sacrifice. It's kind of what it comes down to for me that um, there is no gospel without sacrifice. There is no good news without sacrifice. And the reason that's critical is because the only way that life can come out of death is for life to go into death and come back out. So that's the theology with no boots on the ground. The boots on the ground are if I'm interacting with someone uh, personally and I feel like they've been unjust to me. How do I respond? Uh, if I am seeing that there are laws passed that are oppressive to those who are not as power, how do I, like, how do how do I navigate in ways, or those, or I feel this pressing on me? How do I, uh, how do I navigate that? Uh, like, what do I have to give up? We always have to give up something, and that hurts. And I think. You know, my tendency is to go, oh, I can talk about sacrifice. But I'm really bad at it. Um, I, 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 you know, I think the ways that I don't sacrifice or that I hold on to the old kingdom, I keep really internal. Just ask my wife. <laughs> She'll tell you. She knows the ways that I, she can see what I don't. Um, I think you can't get away from sacrifice. I think that there's no way um, to have a heavenly citizenship and to see that change the world that doesn't involve really hurt. And I think Dave pointed that out, more questions pointed that out. Um, I 
I said, Jared, Jared, you have the answer. <laughs> yeah. no, um, uh, I think two questions, I think. One is, um, you know, um, if, God, if God is in control, I'm not. And he, but he doesn't really need me to do you know, his work in the world, but he does long for me to come alongside what he's doing. Like through the sacrifice of Christ, I have this invitation to come alongside what God's doing in the world. So what is God doing? I think that that's a really important first question, you know, like um, in terms of heavenly citizenship, because it's God's revealing that wisdom day by day, and so it's gonna, you know, um, a day at the office might consist of that, you know, the, the, my priorities for the day and the things that I absolutely must get done, you know. But I think that if there's a way, oh, the student comes in the, you know, in the office and. and um, She's, she's struggling with the class, or something like that, you know. And, and you know, how does that how does that get incorporated, or how does that in, into what I'm trying to achieve for the day? Does that make sense? And like, so she's on an interruption. Instead, that's part of what God's doing right now. What are you doing? And where are you calling? Where, where are you inviting me to come alongside what you're doing? Um, and I think another part of that also is, is being who you are. I think there's a great fear kind of in in, in being who you are. And part of I think that the first ten years after your college too is understand like who am I? Like, you know, what am I for? What am I really for? Um, not just what am I against, you know, but like what are what are the values that resonate most dearly to me? And having the courage to step into that because you know that God's vision is even greater for you. So you look at all the leaders who fail in the world and you say like, oh my gosh, like, you know, leadership is some sort of artificial concept because like, you know, people fail. But then you you say, wow, like God's vision for MLK despite his failings was greater. Like, holy cow. Like, God's vision for, you know, whoever you want to name who was a Christian leader who failed or not, or, you know, it, or, you know, um, it, it was even greater than, than we see. Does that make sense? He was a, he, and, and, and I think that when we start thinking about it that way, it reorients us in our, 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 our vertical and our horizontal. I do think in our horizontal, it, it does reorient our horizontal when we think about heavenly decision making because we, we can begin to think about um, being simultaneously in a relationship with our neighbors and with um, other believers in Christ. And so there's a tendency in the Christian community to want to flee into these havens, these safe havens, right? Like, well, the culture is against me. Therefore, like, what is the kingdom of God calling me to do? It's calling me to um, gather with a lot of Christians into safe havens. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a narrative that's out there. And I think that um, Christ enables us to, one, create societies, Roger Williams, right? Like in Rhode Island, like that actually say like, no, you can live alongside, you can, you, can, uh, you can agree to disagree agreeably with other people and you can take turns in society because of who Jesus is. That's the American experience. People can lead because of who Jesus is. Go back and read Roger Williams, right? And so, like, I think that 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 reorients our relationships horizontally. Um, that 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 means that when we, for me, practically, what that means that means you go to like a atheist, like we're well, not atheistic, but like, but but I would say social science is not necessarily the most receptive to like you know Christian worldview all, all the time. So it's not it's absolutely not sensitive or gentle towards it, you know. And I think that part of me going into political science was thinking like, you know, Jesus, you're calling me in there. And not only that, you're calling me to go there as a Christian, which means that I can ask hard questions of social science based on what I know Christ to be, because I know Christ is a foundation for my thought. And um, that was a struggle. It's a struggle going upstream in a, in a, in a PhD in a PhD degree, like a PhD department sometimes. Um, but I do think that there's a there's reward there. Um, that's a lot, but I think two questions and a reimpatient of the point before time. Yeah, I like that really way you put it, the reorientation of horizontal relationships. And I think in the kingdom of God, the heavenly citizenship, there are no second class citizens. And yet we live in a, in a society where there are second class citizens. We've created an uh, entire generation of second class citizens, mass incarceration, uh, uh, this huge wealth gap, um, the, uh, the public schools closing, uh, and on and on and on. Right? And what is the church doing? The church is divided. <laughs> And wrestling with, you know, just how to get its own people in, in there that look just like them uh, to create these kinds of communities that that is not the kingdom of God. Right? And so, how we press into this um, this re reorientation of horizontal relationships, I think, with I, what Drew says, through sacrifice, you know, actually opening up ourselves uh, and being intentional about 
understanding that we, we have a very impoverished view of the kingdom, a very impoverished view of God. And then apart from this reorientation uh, of seeing the other and actually experience a deep koinonia fellowship with the other, uh, we actually don't have our, our, our we are not expressing our, our, our citizenship. Because in the Revelations, every time you try a nation, like, under God, um, together. One thought, one thought I would add to that is that um, understanding the culture that we're in and the context that we're in, not the culture out there versus the church, but the fact that the church has been a certain way. And that the prophets were very critical to who mostly Israel. And I think the church should have a very much stronger dose of humility. Uh, because a lot of the problems that people have with the church is the hypocrisy they see in the church. It would probably do the, the Christianity as a, as a movement, um, for social scientists, uh, you know, as a, as a religion, if you, were, if you espouse it. It would do a great service to say, yeah, we were wrong. Like, yeah, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church. Like, I have a, one of my closest friends here uh, at Dartmouth. Our, com our relationship started with him saying, all Christians are hypocrites. And I said, that's exactly right. <laughs> and he's, and he, he's yeah. like, well, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> so you want another beer? <laughs> yeah, <they're> actually. <laughs> um, we need to actually be critical of ourselves. And then instead, you don't let go of truth when you're able to be self-critical and go, okay, where are we getting this from? Like, it's just humility. And the gospel, is, I mean, if anything, the gospel is, none of you deserve it. So y'all, everybody should be humble. Y'all should be humble. <laughs> y'all should, should be humble. <laughs> um, I need to, actually, I'm sorry. We have I just to want to, well, yeah. let everybody leave. Please. We might have to be. I, I found, found this book free. Mm -hmm. And on the back of it says, why is it that there lies such an apparent difference between Jesus and his church? Uh, is it Christianity that has failed us in its promises of mm -hmm. peace, protection, and provision? You brought up Roger Williams. I'm from Rhode Island. I know the Roger Williams story because he was hiding down with my people in Narragansett Williams. Mm -hmm. While the church was persecuting him. Uh, I ask everybody here, because I imagine you must have some Christian, you're here, so I figure you must, you must be aligning up to his message. This young man, Mr. Chen, I heard you last year. You spoke about coming up with your two boys, um, coming up to um, the, a man, uh, and you brought him to dinner. Frank. <laughs> Frank, Frank. Okay. That is Christ. That's Christ in you. When that is done with each and every one of us, we wouldn't have a problem. Amen. That's simple. I love every single time you share because it reminds me of who Christ is. Right. And thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Last question. Hard to follow that. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's, it has struck me this morning as we've been talking about creating a meaningful life. And you're an engineer and you know about problem solving and dealing with variables and so on. And and, and the word choice has come up. You use the you use the term, you know, control. So God is in control, we're not in control. So I'd, I'd be curious to know, and, and Mike, you've already talked about examples where you didn't anticipate something and it became a, a kind of learning experience, but <coughs> the role of serendipity or God working in our lives in ways we don't expect, we can make all the plans in the world, even a plan to have a meaningful life, that may not work out like how we expected. So can you talk about how those experiences that you did not expect, maybe didn't ever want, Gave gave you a different perspective, a different learning. I I did not expect to come here and you know go into full time ministry, which is not a linear path for me. I, I with many students here uh, desiring to be pre you know pre med, go to medical school, um, and so I started down that path, but realized very quickly like uh, this is not working now not working out part of my plans and I was very seriously contemplating uh, transfer because very difficult you know academically here 
um, all those different reasons. I could, I could be doing something at a less expensive school. Yeah. You know, all of this. Yeah. Um, but stuck with it and felt like God was doing something in that uh, disruption of my plans. Uh, and uh, it's, it, take, it took many years. It's about having faith. And yes, stop. It, took, it took many years to comprehend uh, and have the courage, actually, to uh, and conviction to, to follow God in what I felt like my calling was. Um, but I think out of that, this is given this this space. You know, having to sort of focus on medicine and, and, and having such routine and schedule uh, on some level felt very comforting to me. Um, but, and, but I would not have the space um, to exercise the gifts that I have. I think in contemplation, in writing, in words, in music, and all of these different things. You know, and so I think God has uh, brought me to a very good, uh, very good place. But uh, it's been hard because I have my plans. <laughs> I, just, yeah. I was designing my great life. Yeah, if you want the long version, uh, to me, in the break room, uh, or not the break room, but the lobby, uh, short. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I think that. I, you know, I'll go back to the family thing. I do think that like that marriage opens your heart, that, that, that kids open your heart in a way that you, um, that is unimaginable. You know, and, and I think that I think that that's a, that's a, um, you end up doing a lot of things where that aren't comfortable, but end up being good, and um, and so I think that. Um, so I think that, that 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 for me is something that I, I embrace. Like I think that it's really that is that is that's awesome. And my wife has lots of gifts that I don't have, you know. And I think that um, I think that uh, you know that kids wake up at you know the first two months of life, their your your schedule revolves around there. So I know you're waking up every two hours, which is insane, you know. But I think that at the same time that that. Um, God uses that to chisel away the pride to show us how, how fearful and anxious we are for me, let's say, you know, and I think that that's, that's a really important light. Um, because you think that, like, oh, I've I got my plan, I'm going to be a winner or whatever. <laughs> and then you're like, oh my gosh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm really deep. And, I, I, and, and there are all these ways in which I didn't realize I was sinful. <laughs> and, um, and I, but, like, thanks be to God that he gives us, like, that he, He's, a, he's working in the world, working through his church, working for my wife, working for my daughter. Like he's one, you know. Like he's he's in all these ways to to to, to chisel me down and um, to make me someone who's actually able to step into his calling. And I think that that uh, that's, that's that's I don't I don't know about some serendipity, but it, like God acting beyond my comprehension. Yeah. Quick thoughts. I I think if you look at the scriptures, you don't find. One character that's written about in depth that has that isn't and doesn't end up in a situation that they didn't plan. Yeah. Yeah. And and the story of God is based on people being in situations they didn't plan. So that's encouraging for me yeah. as an engineer, pastor, engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph is such a non. He's such a great leader, but so not really. Well, I can't name one. I mean, and even like explicitly, Paul saying, you know, we planned to go to Asia, and then we got to the border, and we couldn't. And he said the Holy Spirit prevented us from going. I don't know what that means. But he's like, well, we're not going to Macedonia. Turn it around. But he clearly had a plan, and he wrote about that. He said clearly, like he was fine to say, I had a really good plan, and the destination was Macedonia. And then we got to the border, and you would think, he didn't say, where was God in my planning? <laughs> right? He gets to the border of Macedonia, he's like, uh, nope. So we went to this place instead. We talked at dinner last night very quickly um, about, I think a lot of times, and especially if you're still in, in college, um, it's very easy to think of God's will as a bullseye. We talk about God's will, and it's easy to think of it as like, there's something I need to do, and... I need to aim for it, and I, the, 
the degree to which I miss that bullseye is the degree to which I'm going to be mildly unhappy for the rest of my life. <laughs> I think it's more like a choose your own adventure, right? Or you finish a chapter and you're like, oh, the chapter ended this way. If you'd like to become a pastor, turn to chapter four. <laughs> if you'd like to an engineer, turn to chapter five. And, and the interesting thing is that either way you go, the Lord's with you. Yes. Now, what I don't mean is do whatever you want and the Lord's with you. That gets written about in negative ways in the scriptures. But I do think that, in, again, in that living relationship, you can say, God has given me freedom and creativity and uh, facility so that with him I can walk through his life and create. Now, he might put somebody on the border of Macedonia, and the right response would be to go, oh, scrap the plans, and that's okay. Um, we're, but it doesn't mean you don't plan. Yeah, plan super well, but stay alert, right? and alert from a, on a level that's more than just uh, probably, um, at the end of the day, the bottom line dollar uh, equation, which seems most profitable at the moment. But what, what is God doing in this moment? My, my old boss, Chris, Chris Seipel, from whom I learned a lot, and a lot of those things is paraphrasing stuff he's talking about. Um, but he, he said, he said you know, be, be aggressively patient. And he would always, he would always say stuff like, you know, Jared, I'm just going to go there, I'm going to show up, I'm going to shut up and see if God appeals. And I think that, like, and I think that, that attitude of not saying, hey, plans, plans are horrible, we don't plan. No, plan, plan, plan. Prep, 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 of course, for battle, but understand what Jeremiah says, but God gives a victory, you know? And I think that um, that planning actually gets you in a place where you're able to be aggressive with patients, where you're able to sense God's timing, where you're able to, to listen. And so um, it's, 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 it's being prepared for that victory. You know, that, that, God, that, that yeah. victory that God has invited you to, or that, that adventure that God's invited you to. But um, I like that. Being aggressive with patients. I like that. Yeah. The scripture that came to mind in the line of this end of John. John's Gospel, and Jesus reinstates Peter and then says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Amen. Amen. We're not very good at being that. Let's start now. <laughs>